right, everybody, how you doing? Yeah, last talk of the day. You guys excited to talk about Backbone? All right, me too. Okay, so I'm Spike Brem. I'm a web developer at uh, Airbnb, which is a local company a couple blocks away. Uh, and I want to talk about Render, which is something that we're open sourcing today. You can go check it out on GitHub. Um, <laughs> Uh, and it's a, it's a little, little library that we've written that allows you to render your backbone apps on the client and in the server. So I want to start with a brief history lesson of the Airbnb web app. So in 2008, which is when we were founded, uh, this, is what, this is what it looked like. This was airbedandbreakfast.com. It's a little Rails app, very static, very typical of the web in 2008. Maybe a little bit of JavaScript sprinkled here and there, but for the most part, completely server-side. And it's beautiful, right? Um, and it's amazing. In the last five years, there's been so much that has happened. I mean, I don't think this conference even existed five years ago. Um, and so today, our homepage looks like this. And this is basically, a, uh, when you land on the homepage, there's a Backbone app that bootstraps itself. And there's way more JavaScript, uh, way more everything. I mean, it's probably at least a megabyte, <laughs> sad to say. But uh, there's, there's, been, there's been so much innovation in the last few years. And, uh, but I think we're not, we're not quite there yet. So it's an exciting time in the world of web apps today. There's all these cool frameworks that allow you to build rich apps like Backbone, Ember, Angular. Uh, basically, you know, there's a million of them. There's an, another one released every day. Just like today, render. Um, <laughs> um, and there's a lot of fragmentation. And this is kind of what we're seeing mostly. This is like the client side MVC model, which is very popular these days. So you've got the client on the top, the server on the bottom. Basically, the idea is most of your app runs on the client side. Your, your view rendering, your routing, your like, model persistence, internationalization, all that stuff. And then your JavaScript app, which is running on the client side, talks to an API for data. Pretty standard. And the server can be various levels of dumb and stateless. Um, and so we've been, we've been making apps like this. This is our wish lists app, which we released this past, I guess, about six months ago. And it's a rich backbone app, which lays loads data and uses push state and all this fancy stuff. And you know it works pretty well. It's, uh, it's backbone on Rails. And it's, it's, it's a pretty nice user experience, but there's a few issues that we noticed. So first of all, there's poor SEO. You all know why, because it renders on the client side. It's not serving anything to crawlers. Um, but more importantly, there's a huge performance hit, because before you can really render anything meaningful to the user, you have to download and parse a couple hundred kilobytes of JavaScript, um, and then and evaluate it. And then finally, you can start to render your UI. And finally, there's a duplicated application logic, oftentimes. Because especially if you start off with a Rails app, you, you tend to migrate more and more of your logic to JavaScript, to Backbone, and you start to duplicate things like currency formatting, internationalization, like view logic, weird, you know, weird model logic. Um, and then finally, context switching. So sometimes you'll be switching between working in JavaScript, working in Ruby, uh, and I think that's a bit of a drag. And so it's still a bit of a pain in the ass to build fast, maintainable, rich client apps. There's no silver bullet. There's no like, great way uh, for a small team to build a, a really scalable, performant, beautiful experience, uh, which is a shame. So we started thinking, what if our JavaScript app could run on both sides? What problems would this solve? Uh, and wouldn't this be awesome? I've been, I've been dreaming of this for like years, and we Getting close. Um, so this is what that might look like. This is the holy grail, which you've probably, you've probably heard people call, refer to this as the holy grail. So the bulk of your application logic runs shared between the client and the server. So it's routing, your view rendering, your model logic, all that kind of stuff. And then, of course, certain things only happen on one side or the other, whether that's handling user, like you know, browser events, or logging might just happen on the server. But the idea is your application, the core of your application, shouldn't be restricted to one environment or another. It should be able to run on both sides. And then both, both sides can talk to the same API in the same way. This is this dream. 
And so it'll provide SEO because you're, you're serving up real, uh, real content from your server. And initial page load is drastically faster. I can't really stress this enough. I mean, you saw Steve Suter's keynote this morning. But uh, so Twitter, you, you remember Twitter used to have a hash bang in the URL about a year ago, a year and a half ago. So they, that was pretty cute. This all client side is very uh, trendy. But then they ended up spending a year and 40 developers switching them back to client side, or switching back to server side rendering because of performance. And they had a metric which was first, time to first tweet, which is how long from refreshing the page to seeing that first tweet show up. And they cut that by five times, which is really significant. And there's, that's like very directly correlated to uh, users staying on your site, you making money. So that's, that's huge. And finally, consolidated application logic. Because it's all in JavaScript, uh, and it's all in one place, you don't have to duplicate stuff, which is awesome. So we started looking around. We thought, has anyone already done this? Because we don't want to be in the business of creating frameworks, because that's not really fun to do, or a good use of time. So we looked. There's, there's a few projects out there. There's Meteor, which you've probably heard of. Um, it's, it's got some really interesting client server side stuff. It runs on Node. But it doesn't actually render on the server side. It just has a PhantomJS plugin, which is, it can scrape itself. So that, that wasn't really cool. Uh, and it also owns the entire data layer. It kind of expects everything to be in Mongo. And uh, it, it wants to own that. And it's hard to attack that onto an, to an existing app or to a RESTful API. There's a similar project called Derby, uh, which is also a Node framework. And this is cool. It actually does client-side, server-side rendering using handlebars and does some really neat stuff. It's real time. Um, but again, it owns that whole d data layer in Mongo, and that wasn't going to fly for us. And you guys might remember Mojito. You, you guys have heard of Mojito? Has anyone heard of Mojito in the last two years? <laughs> uh, so it came out in 2010, and I was really excited about it, uh, because it was, it's this Node.js thing. Your, your app can run everywhere. Um, but it didn't really catch on. I think there's a couple of reasons. One is it's like very full stack. It, you have to, you have to, it's good for a Greenfield app, right? You have to write your whole app in Mojito. And another issue is it's YUI, which is Yahoo User Interface Library. So Yahoo is a bit of a branding problem with its open source projects. If you were anything like me, when you saw that blog post announcing Mojito, and you looked at the code sample, the first thing you saw was YUI dot, then you stopped reading, which is a, kind of a sad reality. But, um, but he has some cool shit in it. I would like to look at that. Uh, that that that's would be a cool other talk. So we thought, all right, well, how hard can it be? Let's see what we can do. And we started with our mobile web app, mobile website. So you could go check this out on your phone if you want right now. This is m.airbnb.com. This was a Backbone and Rails app, just like our, our Wishlist app. Uh, but we thought it would be a great test bed to try a new approach, because it's fairly separate from the rest of the site, and it was kind of its own little code base. So we decided to replace Rails with Node with the, the dream of sharing code between client and server. And this is in production. This has been in production since, I guess, December. Uh, so you can check it out. And so this was the genesis of Render. So what is Render? It's JavaScript MVC on the client server. So models, views, collections, et cetera. Backbone and handlebars is the, back, is, excuse me, is the backbone of render. Um, and there's, there's a bunch of base classes, which I'll get into later. But, but the, the basic idea is it builds on top of the standard backbone classes and then adds a few more and kind of decorates them rather than trying to reinvent the wheel. Because many of us know the backbone conventions. And so why would we uh, rewrite that when we already have a community? And then finally, it's a set of Express middleware, because you know, Express is the, the de facto Node.js web server, basically. And the idea is Express, like Backbone, has a large community, a set of conventions. So you can just tack on render app to an existing Express app, which is kind of cool. Then this is actually finally. Um, and there's minimal glue between client and server to make it all kind of work together. So here's what it's not. It's not a batteries included web framework. It's not something that you're going to go to your boss tomorrow and say, I'm going to rewrite our entire site and render um, yet. 
and it's not finished. So it's, it's a bit of a prototype, which we have running in production on a few apps, and it works. Uh, and if you're the brave sort, I encourage you to, to download it today and uh, poke around on it. I'll show you the link in a bit. So here were our basic design goals for render. So the first and foremost is write application logic agnostic to environment. The core of your application logic is things like, what data should I fetch? What attributes on this model am I interested in? How do I transform those attributes into something to pass to a view? What is my template? A lot of that um, isn't necessarily tied to an environment. And so the goal is to abstract that out uh, from, from the environment. So another goal is to make it a library and not a framework. And so I kind of think of Backbone versus Ember. So Backbone is very much a library. It's kind of a set of, a set of classes you can build upon uh, rather than like an all-encompassing solution for every problem you could ever have. And I think it's easier for people to get started and it's easier to maintain. And then people can write plugins to do the rest. We want to minimize code that looks like this. If server, then do some stuff else do some stuff. If you've got code like this that's like all of your application, that's a sign that you did something wrong. Right? That's a leaky abstraction. And so, of course, sometimes you have to do this, but the idea is to consolidate that in certain places and, and provide the abstractions so the application developer doesn't have to think about that if they don't have to, if they don't want to. To go along with that, we want to hide as much of this complexity for solving this problem into the library rather than the application code. It was important for us to talk to a RESTful API for all the data, because we already had it. It was powering other apps. And um, it's just, you know, just like Backbone is set up by default to talk to speak REST. So this, this was important for us. It also kind of precludes real time. So real time is this other big area of, uh, of research in web apps, which we didn't even address. We didn't want to have a server side DOM. There are implementations out there, but they're slow, and uh, it just doesn't feel right to have to use a server-side DOM. And like I mentioned before, we want it to be some, a set of simple express middleware that you can include into an express app. So there's a few base classes I'm just going to mention quickly um, that we provide. So there's a base app, and the app is the kind of the context that is the glue that holds everything else together. Uh, every model view collection has a reference to app, which is uh, kind of an unfortunate thing that comes from the fact that on Node, you have these concurrent requests happening at all times, and you can't access a global. In the browser, you might be used to saying window.app. You know, whatever, and mutate state or access state. Uh, you can't do that. So we have this app that we will inject down to every class. There's a base model, which uh, inherits from backbone model. So, so I forgot to mention that app also inherits from backbone model. We do that mostly so we can set attributes on it and we can listen for changes on attributes. It's just useful. So base model extends backbone model and that provides just a few utilities for making it uh, easier to, to work with in render and deal, handle like whether you're on the client or the server. Base collection is the same, same idea. We've got base view, and that's a little more interesting. Um, on the server, we override all the DOM methods. Uh, and we also provide kind of a view lifecycle, which is similar to some of these other backbone uh, like plugins. I'll, I'll get into that in a moment. We've got an app view, which extends base view and is responsible for kind of global events, like user, user, action, user interaction events. We've got a client router and a server router, which extend a base router. And this is, this is not the backbone router. This is just, uh, a class of our own. So the base router handles, holds all the, the common logic between parsing routes and, uh, and matching routes and handling that part of the app. And then the client router has a backbone router that it, that it delegates to. And then the server router will just delegate to Express. There's also, we have like a model store and a collection store and a fetcher. And these are a few classes that just make it easier to manage like bootstrapping data into your application. And I'll get into that in a second. So I thought it might be easy to start with the directory structure 
of first render and then of an application. So render is the library, right, not the application. So render has a few main directories. Things are split out into client, shared, and server, then there's subdirectories. And the idea is that client and shared, we will send to the client, we'll send to the browser. But server, obviously we won't. Server might hold things like middleware and the server router, and then client will have the client router, and then shared is the bulk of it, right? There's like the base, the base app, the base model, base collection. And so in an application, there's a pretty basic directory structure. There's the app directory, um, public, which is assets and stuff, and then server, which is server-specific stuff, like middleware. And so if we look into app, there's, this kind of looks like a hybrid of a Rails app and a Backbone app, kind of. So there's like collections and models, which you're used to. We've introduced controllers. There's views and templates. And then a few class, a few, a few, a few modules here. App.js, which is your, your base application context that ties everything together. There's a router and a routes file. And so the entire app directory gets sent to the client because that's what's shared. So one thing that's really neat about this approach, my, probably my favorite part is uh, using Stitch. So I don't know if you've heard of Stitch. It's, it's uh, similar to Browserify. It's a way for you to package up your modules to use them in a common JS way in the, in the client side. And it allows us to, to use modules in the same way on the client and server. So on the server, we might say var user equals require, and then the path to the user. And one thing that we can also do on the server is, so render is shipped as an NPM module. So you, you can require into an NPM module to get at the modules that are inside of it. So we can say base view equals require, and then the path to that base view within the module. Using some stitch trickery uh, with grunt in our deploy process, we can do the same thing in the client. It's exactly the same. And that's, that's really neat because you just think about the path to the module. You don't think about, um, you don't have to deal with AMD or anything like that. And here's the routes file. It should look similar to Rails, basically. You're matching a pattern to a controller and an action. And then you can also pass additional parameters if you want to. But in this case, this is the user's controller and the show action. So I'm going to walk through the rendering cycle of like rendering a user's show action. It's a bit complicated, so stay with me. <laughs> so on the server, it looks like this. When we start the express server, we'll parse that routes file and mount uh, express routes on the, on the express app that correspond to each of those routes. And then let's say we've got a request coming in for user slash some ID, uh, user slash one, two, three, seven. So this, is, this comes into the server. Uh, Express will, will handle, it'll match a route. So, the, so then we have our router class. That matches that pattern to the user's show action. And then it'll also create these params, right? And so it pulls the ID out of the pattern, out of the URL, and, and grabs that. So ID equals one, three, three, seven. And then the router will We'll grab the controller, and so we use naming conventions just to make it easier. So users corresponds to users controller. So the router will grab that. It'll execute the show action on the user controller and pass in these params. And then what the action does is the action does, has two responsibilities, fetching the data and saying which view to render. So the action, in this case, will say, fetch user number 1337, and then use the user show view class to render this page. So then the router will take that information. It'll render the, the it'll create a new instance of the user show view, and it'll inject the data. And then on that view instance, it'll call get HTML. And so that's a method I've added to backbone view to the base view. So get HTML will do things like uh, you know, evaluate the template with the data, and it's the outer HTML of the view. And then we just hand that to Express. Express decorates that with a layout and serves it. 
So it sounds pretty basic, right? Like a pretty basic kind of rendering flow of any MVC app. Um, it's very similar on the client side with a few differences. So instead of on server startup, we have on page load, the router will parse that routes file and mount each one of those as a backbone route. And when a push state event comes in, because it's all push state, if you don't have push state enabled, then you just fall through to the server. We don't even deal with you. It's nice. Um, so when a push state event comes in for a certain path, the router will match it to controller in action and params. It'll find the controller. It'll execute the show action with the parameters. The show action says to fetch this data, use this view. The router will then instantiate the view with the data. This all should sound familiar. And then the, where the difference is, the router calls view.render. And so that will, th then the view will create a DOM element and insert all of the HTML into the DOM element. And then we just insert that into the DOM. So this whole part is exactly the same. Right? This whole part is just application logic. And it's not specific to environment at all. Now the rest of it is uh, is specific to environment, but it's analogous. It's like this par it's a parallel uh, metaphor. That doesn't make sense. It's parallel, um, and so that's the whole idea behind render. So I want to look at some code. So here's the user's controller with a show action, and it's just a real basic common JS module. This is the most trivial case. So we've got the key here is that's the name of the action show, um, and we pass in several things to it. We pass in params and then a callback. Params in this case is ID equals one three three seven, and the callback is uh, is kind of like the render callback. So right here, we're calling it first argument is null, which means because the first argument in Node.js convention is often an error, so this means there's no error, and then we're going to execute it with uh, telling it that this is the view we're going to render. And that's, that's like the total trivial case. This is if you're not just fetching any data, you're just rendering an action. It's, it's synchronous. Um, that's what you do. But that's not very interesting. So let's actually fetch the data. So it's a little more complicated once we fetch some data. But basically, <clears throat> the idea is we specify which which model or collection we want. So here we're saying we have a, a model property, and then that corresponds to a, a user model with params, and you pass in these params. And so params ID equals 1337. Uh, and then we have, we have access to our app here, our little app uh, instance because we're executing this within the context of the router. So you can call this dot redirect to this dot, uh, a few other things. But the app is kind of the glue. So the app has a fetch method, which delegates to a, some fetcher class. Uh, so you, you pass in what you want to fetch, and then a, you give it a callback. And so the, when it's done fetching, or if it's fetched it from the cache, it will, then, then it calls the callback. And so that first parameter is error. So if, say, there was a 500 from the, from the API, or a 400, or a 404, or whatever, you can handle that in the middleware. So it just passes that through. And then you tell what, what the view is. And then results here is an object. So the key is model, and the value is the actual model instance. So this is a bit of abstraction, right? Because you can imagine we could just create, we could do var user equals new user, user.fetch. Um, what, what abstracting this does is it, is it gives us some flexibility and, and it gives us like there's uh, some caching that can happen, there's error handling. Also, it, it's important for the bootstrapping part uh, for that first render. And I'll show you how that works, but basically, when we fetch all of our data for a certain view, we end up needing to uh, bootstrap it onto the page. And so this will handle that part. And now, remember, this code gets run on both sides. This is run on the client side and the server side. It's kind of hard to wrap your head around at first. Um, so on push state action, this will this will this will execute. It'll fire an XHR to the, to the API, get your data. 
And on the server, it'll just go straight to the API. So let's look at a view. This would be the view for this action. So we're going to extend the base view. And you can see we're just using like the CommonJS pattern, because we, we, we're using Stitch here. And this is just classic backbone, right? So base view.extend, we'll pass in some stuff. And so here, we're passing class name. You can also add events, hash, and all sorts of other methods. But you, you notice there's no render method. Uh, stay tuned for that. And we're also adding this ID to the constructor. This is a bit of a, this is, this is one thing I'd like to find a better way to do, to, to do this. But basically, the, the constructor, the view needs to know what it is. And that helps for hydrating it later, once you get to the client side. So, OK, yeah, so we could add events to this, event handlers, different things. So this view does get run on both sides, but none of that event stuff will ever happen on the server. It's just for the client, and it's a convenience to keep it in the same, in the same class. So that's the user's show view. Here's the user's show view template. And um, it's very basic. We're just going to say username from city. This is, this is handlebars. And what this turns into when you render the HTML is something like this. So we've got our DOM element with the class name we specified. We've got our content. Um, but there's a few data elements here. It's our data attributes we've added. So the first one is data-view. And that specifies what the view class is that we rendered, that it corresponds to. And that's important for once we get to the client side, we need to match that up with an actual class. Um, we also specify what the, the user, sorry, what the model name and the model ID are, because we need to fetch that from the bootstrap data. So you might be asking, where'd that data come from? Where's the render method? How do I customize what gets past the template? And the answer is just sensible defaults. So my, one of my hypotheses about views is you should never write a, a render method ever, unless you're doing something custom, which is what Daryl was saying. Um, there's a few methods you can extend. So it, let's say, so by default, the view, like if you call render, if you call get HTML, it knows what the template name is based on the name of the view. It knows what data by default, because uh, if you pass it a model or a collection, it'll basically just call 2JSON on it and do something smart. But if you want to change that, you can. So there's a get template data method, for example, which by default is just model 2JSON. So let's say we want to decorate what we're passing to the template with some other data. So we call super here with JavaScript. Um, and so data in this case is basically just model.2json. And then we can decorate that with, let's say, name uppercase, because we're very shouty. So uh, return, extend the data with name uppercase. Then we can change our template to have the key. And then there it is. So that's just a little example of, of with views. There's a lot of other stuff with views. There's actually this whole view hierarchy and a declarative way of nesting your views uh, using a handlebars helper. But I don't think I have time to get into that quite yet. So stay tuned for future updates. Here's what that HTML looks like in the context of your entire page on your first load. So this is a bit simplified. But in bold here, that's, that's our view. The rest of it's in the layout. Um, and at the bottom, we bootstrap our app. So we create our app instance. And so window.app is app. And that's really useful because you can go in the, in the inspector and type app.router. You know, all sorts of stuff. And it's kind of inspect the state of your app. And then we have a bootstrap data method. So this is everything that we've, all the data that we, uh, that we fetched in the controller, we want to pass that through so it can be hydrated into like real classes once we get to the client side. So in this case, um, it's, it's a user. There's the data and, and whatnot. So this leads to view hydration. So one of the, the tricky things when we first came across this problem is, so do you, when you load the page, how do you attach all your background views with the elements? How do you attach them with the right data? Do you just, you could do two things, basically. You could just re-render everything and throw away what you had. And then you would have, uh, then all your events are bound, and you've got all, all, everything created nicely. 
but then you, there might be a flicker and you might lose some important context because somebody could be typing in an input field or whatever and you would lose that. Um, so, and then the other approach, which is what we decided upon, is to, to reconstruct your, your backbone classes based on the DOM. So that's what I'm calling view hydration. So the first step is find all the DOM elements with a data view attribute because those are those represent views. And so this is like kind of pseudo code to go along with it, but basically we would use jQuery and find all the elements. And then we want to look at the data attributes and figure out if it corresponds to a, a model or a collection or both. And so we'll figure out what's, what's the model name, what's the model ID, and if we were to log this out, in our little example it would be user in 1337. So we know, we know the name of the view, we know the, the name of the model. So then we would fetch, fetch the model or collection data from either the model store or the collection store. And I'm not going to go too detail about this, but, but that's when we bootstrap the data, we're just shoving everything into the model store or the collection store. So we can say var model equals model store dot git, model name, model ID, and that'll return us like an actual user instance. So then we need to get the view class, like the background class that represents that view. So we'll grab the view name based on the data element. We'll require that module. And then we just instantiate the view instance, pass in the data. So in this case, we'll do var view equals new view class, pass in the model, a few other things. And then we'll attach to the, to the DOM element that we already have found. So view set element view L, and then delegate events. And that's pretty much all we need to do. So then we have, we have our view hierarchy can be reconstructed in the client side. They're real, they're real backbone views. They've got their proper models, and the events are bound. And so at that point, you just have a backbone app. And then the final step is profit. Uh, so it's a, it's a bit of a hoop you have to jump through, but then you've got a fully working backbone app work, uh, running the client side. You, br you browse around, it fires per state events, and it's just like any other backbone app you've ever seen, except for that whole first step. So uh, render is available starting today. Look under your seats. You've got render. B and bees. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, I should have put that GIF in. Um, so if you go to Airbnb slash render, you can check it out. Disclaimer, there's not enough documentation. I'm working on that. Um, there's also a sample app which you can check out, render-app-template, which you can find on the GitHub page. And it's just a real basic app which uses the public GitHub API as an example. So I encourage you to, to boot that up and see how it works for you. So there's still a lot to do, because it turns out this is a really hard problem, and it's really difficult to get the right abstractions, and you have to touch pretty much every part of the application. Um, so one of the things is to properly share the routing logic between client and server. So right now, I mentioned we're using Backbone Router and Backbone History on the client side to do all that matching, and then we use Express on the server side. Um, that works except for some special cases. So until Backbone 0.9.10, which was released, I don't know, a month ago, if your URL had a query string in it, then it wouldn't match. <laughs> so you end up having to duplicate all your routes or hack around that. Another thing that's interesting is before matching all of your routes, like if you, if you have a Backbone router and you list your routes, Backbone reverses the object or the array or whatever, and then it matches them, which is kind of strange. So you have to, Reverse those. And then another one that bit us in the butt a couple days ago in production uh, was trailing slashes. <laughs> what the f <laughs> so, so on Express, if you have a trailing slash, it doesn't care. It's just, you know, it'll, it'll, it's, it works fine. And Backbone, if you have a trailing slash, it doesn't work. Um, so I just got around that for now. The really simple Express middleware, if somebody lands on your, on your site and there's a trailing slash, just redirect them with a 301. That works, but if we shared that all that logic in a single module, 
then it wouldn't be an issue. So another thing is, I'd love to be able to lazy load like view classes and templates and model classes and stuff. So at the moment, we package everything up into one big bundle, which works fine for smaller apps. But as our app grows, it makes more sense to lazy load those. It'd be cool to support other templating lang languages. So there's a few um, handlebars view helpers which we're using, which allow you to do like nested uh, view hierarchies and stuff. But that's almost kind of a separate. That can even be a separate module. So it'd be cool to support Jade and whatever else you guys like. Coffee Cup, Eco, EJS, Haml, ERB. I don't know. Um, and I'd like to break it down into smaller modules because. Like, for example, the view hierarchy could be its own module. This router could be its own module, which you could just use with an express app without render. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of these little concepts which would make sense to, to break out. But in our prototype, in our getting things to work on production, it's just kind of all in there. So there's, there's some cleanup to be done. And I invite you to help. Also, uh, we need to rewrite it in JavaScript. So right now, it's mostly CoffeeScript. I know it's controversial. It's probably not actually as controversial because you're all front-end developers mostly. But if you go to like a Node.js conference and you say it's all CopyScript, people won't be happy. Uh, so I think, it, I think it does make sense to write it, rewrite it in JavaScript because it's easier to solicit contributions from the, from the community. It's less fragmented. Um, so that's ongoing. Feel free to help out. And there's a lot more to be done because, you know, I, I said one of my goals was to create a small library which you can build upon rather than a framework. But it turns out frameworks are useful. Um, and right now, it's somewhere in the middle. So it enforces some, some amount of structure on your app. And it'd be cool to make that more modular and support different use cases. So hackers are wanted. Uh, I really would love if, if you guys are interested to clone the repo, poke around in it, and su submit some issues. because. Um, it's really only a few months old, and it needs a lot more work, but I think this is an interesting approach. I don't so for render, I'm not int like intending for it to be like the next big thing that everyone uses for every app. Uh, it's more of a prototype, and it works. We're running in production, but I imagine that it's like one stepping stone along the road to a much brighter future. Um, and there's tons of different approaches you could take. So in fact, uh, there was Tim Brannion had another talk earlier today on Backbone on the server, and his approach was very different, but also very similar. And then Lori is doing a talk tomorrow on Backbone on the server, and his approach was very different, to very similar to both of ours. And so there's like a lot of, I'd imagine there's a lot of people trying to solve the same problem, and there's some common ground uh, which we can take advantage of. So that's that's actually all I have. Um, so I guess I have some time for questions. And I can even show you some code if you want some code. <laughs> Cacheability. OK, caching. So there's a couple of different caching. There's a lot of different layers of caching there could be, right? So you're talking about like when I mentioned the caching of uh, XHRs in and, and the views. Oh, interesting. So, the only caching we do right now is uh, if, you're, if you try to fetch a model with a certain ID or a collection with certain parameters, and we already have it, then we won't refetch it. And we just cache it in memory. For a while, we were caching that in local storage, which is cool, but that introduces a whole other set of problems, like what if there's different users using it, uh, privacy, um, exceeding your quota. So we took that out. So we're doing some very basic caching. So if you it's just caching within a certain page refresh. Now, you, you could add other layers. We don't, we're not caching views or anything. We have pre-compiled handlebars templates. Um, you could add a caching layer on the server, or in a, like a reverse proxy, and that wouldn't have anything to do with render itself. So to summarize, what he asked is, uh, how the heck does the, the view hydration really work? And you're right. So the idea is, we go through, uh, let me look at, uh, a real app. So this is Airbnb Mobile. Oh, wait, you can't see that, can you? It's really good resolution. So 
I'm gonna knock him. I'm just knocking him here. Okay. So this is this is not running on production. Um, this is made of a, a bunch of different views. This is like the listings show page. Uh, you can click to other places. It's really it's really fast, right? Push state. It's pretty cute. Okay, but your question was about view hydration. So if we take a look at the source here. So there's a bunch of different views that have this data view attribute. And for, so here is the listing view. You can see that, all right? Um, so yeah, so, so we just go through and look for every DOM element that has an attribute like that. And then we can require the, the class and then, you know, the model, the appropriate model on this thing, or model or collection. And that, I mean, that's about it. And so yeah, Tim Brannion, he, he did the, the Flickr, and uh, in his approach, he didn't do this, I think mostly because it's hard and it was a bit of a prototype. Um, and so, but it, it basically works, right? So you create a view class for each one of these views. And one thing that, that it does as well, so you see that there's views within views here. So when you hydrate, it'll go through and create a hierarchy of views. And there's like a parent and children. And so they can reconstruct all that and attach the right context and attach the right models and collections to each one of those, which is actually pretty cool, I think. Um, did that answer your question? Oh, and then at the bottom, we, we bootstrap all the data. And so if you, if you have an unoptimized API endpoint, like a public API which you're developing off of, which has a bunch of extra crap in it, then this might be a bad idea because there'll be all this stuff which you don't need. Um, but if you can have control over your API responses, it's not so bad. Question? Yeah, when you built this, did you consider building off of, yeah, wow, this is loud. Uh, did you consider building off of um, Backbone Marionette or Chaplin or one of these other libraries that already adds it, some of these additional features to the client side? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good question. So I looked at those, looked at Marionette a bit. I think they all have really useful, uh, useful things that they add on top of render. And I think they can all, a lot of those can be used directly with render or can be, you, you could create similar plugins for, for render. So I don't think render should have opinions about a lot of those things, right? Mir Marionette's a great example of, of things which you can add on top of, of it to make it easier. And I would like to leave that to the community. But definitely some of those concepts. Chaplin is really cool. If you guys haven't seen Chaplin, it's, it's awesome. It's an application framework built on Backbone. It's all in CoffeeScript. And I was actually inspired by them a lot. So my routes file looks exactly like the Chaplin routes file. They've, that's where I got the idea for controllers. Um, and they do interesting stuff with how like events, they all, or sorry, all the modules communicate with each other through via events, um, which is really neat. I, I'd like to actually be more inspired by it. I think I got a few more minutes. You guys want to see more code? How much, so how much traffic can it withstand? Um, so far a lot. I mean, our mobile app doesn't even get like a whole lot of traffic. Um, but I mean, we've got three web servers running in AWS supporting this. And the only reason we have so many is for redundancy. I mean, CPU is like pegged at basically zero. Um, I mean, the, the node is super fast compared to Ruby or Rails, which this replaced. Um, we're not seeing any issues there. But I imagine those issues might arise um, once, we, once you start to push, push it harder. Uh, one thing, another thing that I'll mention I didn't mention before is like session management. So this is something that we added in our apps but isn't part of the framework, sorry, or the, the library, excuse me. Um, but it's easy to add, you know, it's easy to express session middleware and then you can, you can uh, add it to, the, to your app instance. And I'll, I'll create, an, I'll do that in the, the sample, the app sample so you guys can see it. Unless there's any more questions, I've got three more minutes and I want to show you some code. Okay, cool. So, uh, <laughs> okay. So let's take a look at a real live app. So this is our mobile website. Um, what's a good example? 
so this is this is the search view, which corresponds to to this. Um, so you'll notice there's this view helper, and here this is including the search bar view here with no arguments. Here we're including a search listings view, passing in the collection. So this is this is an interesting concept, which I think is actually separate from render, but um, is pretty useful. So the idea to declaratively nest your templates, um, and so this will create this will actually create a, a view hierarchy in the client side. So if we were to look, oops. so if we did well, first of all, here's our app instance, right? We've got app dot router, which is a which is the client side router. We can do app dot router dot current view, which is the search view. So you see here, this is the current view. And then you can also inspect different stuff in here, right? There, there's a oh, there's no model here. It's a collection, I think. It's a collection. You can do different stuff on it. Whatever. Um, but there's also child views. So in this case, there's two child views. And this was all created using that view, temp that view helper. And so we've got the search bar view. Let's look at the search listings view. Oops. And so you can see these are the listings. Um, this actually subclasses something which, there's, there's like a couple levels of uh, object oriented hierarchy here because it's this like infinite list view. So there's infinite scroll. Um, and it manages that, and we use that a few different places. But, but it's neat because if we look here, child views, there's, each one of these is a separate backend view with its own model. Um, and that's kind of neat. Well, what else? So I mentioned bootstrapping. So we've got app.fetcher, which is a little utility that helps us fetch things. And then there's like a model store, and there's a collection store. Um, and this is just kind of a central place to s stick these things when you when you fetch them from the API. So, the model store we've we've like, oops, what do we have in here? So we've got all these different, basically, all these different objects. So the, you can see this this is the model, the model name and ID. Um, and one thing that's neat is so let's say we refresh m.airbnb.com. It returns the full page, um, no flicker or anything. And the, but we, we loaded, we bootstrapped every model for each of these listings. And so what we can do is we'll, we'll click on one of these. And it, that was instant, right? Because we already had the data for that model. But we don't have, that's a smaller representation when we get it in, in like a collection like that. So we had a few really important things. We had the name, we had the photo. Uh, the first three photos, and so what we'll do is we'll instantly render that, but then in the background it's actually doing a fetch. Oh, jeez. But we're we're fetching from the API, um, and then re-rendering that smartly. So that's that's like a neat thing that's actually built into render so far. What does it look like? You mean like the actual UI or the code? Yeah, sure. So I actually might. I'm just about out of time. Um, follow up on that with me. I think that's all I have. So if you have more questions or you want to talk, come find me. Find me on Twitter, Spike Rem. Find me on GitHub. Find Airbnb at GitHub. And we're obviously hiring. We're trying to hire as many great, Jesus, great engineers as we can. So that means you. So come talk to me. All right. Thanks, guys.